Happy New Year, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. It may be a new year, but the issues surrounding the 2020 presidential election are still front and center. Yesterday, the nation's capital was stormed by rioters determined to interrupt Congress from certifying the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris as the next president and vice president of the United States. Four people died, 14 police officers injured, pipe bombs and other explosives were found and disabled, and the Capitol building was ransacked. The nation was stunned. The conversation in the black community, white privilege at its finest. Confused by that response? We'll unpack it for you next on Another View, so stay tuned. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. On behalf of the Another View crew, we wish you love, peace, health, happiness, and wealth in 2021. Our original plan was to celebrate our 10th anniversary on the radio and introduce you to our new theme music composed by our very own Jay Sennett. But in light of yesterday's events, we postponed our celebration until later this month. We're still reeling from the assault on the nation's capital yesterday, the attempt by Trump supporters to thwart the certification of President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris as the successors to President Donald Trump and Vice President Mike Pence. While the rioters' actions are stunning and disgusting to many, in the Black community, the stark contrast to law enforcement response in this instance compared to the response of the Black Lives Matters protests this summer is a bleak reminder of how very differently you are treated in this country based on the color of your skin. We have a lot to unpack this hour. To help us with the conversation is Dr. Eric Claville, Director of the Center for African American Public Policy at Norfolk State University. Hello, Eric. How are you? Happy New Year, Barbara. So glad to be with you. Unfortunately, under these circumstances, but glad glad to be with you. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us, especially at the last moment. We appreciate that. Arthur, speaker, multimedia communications consultant, and former Metro News columnist for the Daily Press in Newport News. Please welcome Dr. Will Leviste. How are you, Dr. Leviste? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, uh, Barbara, as well, and happy anniversary. Thank you. Even (laughs) even under these circumstances, you still need to celebrate that slam mark. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And new to the Another View program is author, journalist, and professor, professor of professional practice, uh, at the School of Global Journalism and Communication at Morgan State University, Mr. Wayne Dawkins. Hello, Wayne. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for the invite. And um, greetings to those of you out there, especially I'm still in touch with my many Hampton friend and brilliant students. <laughs> and happy 10th. Exactly. Thank you. I appreciate that very, very much. I want you guys to take a listen to something real quick. USA! They don't get to steal it from us. They don't get to tell us we didn't see what we saw. We respect the law. We were good people. The government did this to us. We were normal, good, law-abiding citizens, and you guys did this to us. We want our country back. We are protesting for our freedom right now. That's the difference. We all know that they changed the rules mid-game, and they're not being held accountable, and that's a shame. This is our country. This is our house. That's it. This is our house. This is our country. This is our country. Will, I want to get yeah, I want to get the response from each of you as you were watching this. That was just some of the sounds from people who were rioting, not protesting, at the Capitol yesterday. Well, as you were watching the coverage, what were your thoughts? I was just, I mean, I was appalled. I was shocked, but at the same time, not surprised. Um, it's just, I mean, just living in this country, working as a journalist, growing up and living as a black man, and just seeing this, it should not be surprising, but it's still shocking that, you know, you would think that at your capital that such a thing could happen. And then, obviously, I mean, one of the first things I tweeted out was, 
if this was BLM, everyone there would be DOA. Yeah. I mean, it's like, how how is it that law enforcement can be out in mass force for Black Lives Matter, a peaceful demonstration, right, over something that there's verifiable proof of a black man and several black people being killed, verifiable proof, stuff on video, and they're out in force for peaceful protests. But here you have individuals who are out protesting something that they brought no verifiable proof of an election being stolen. They've gone through the process. The courts have thrown it out. These have, in many cases, have been Republican states where the votes have been counted. And they're saying, okay, what is your proof? They brought no proof, and they're storming our capital. I mean, it's the breach of security is beyond comprehension that this could happen at our capital at the very core of our democracy over what evidence? Mm. And I keep going back to what is your evidence? If you have a grievance, the law says bring proof of your grievance. And the other thing that just kept coming to mind is how can Trump be the law and order president and also be one who's encouraging a, a total destruction of the law? at the seat of our democracy. How do you reconcile that? And that's a question that I have for, particularly for your white listeners. How do you also say that this is the law and order president who has encouraged lawlessness at the very core seat of our democracy with no verifiable proof of an election being stolen? Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile that? Because if you can't, then you have a serious problem. Wayne, I'm curious as to your response when you were watching the events unfold yesterday. Okay. Well, first of all, I got the heads up from my brother-in-law, Tony Cox, when he texted the family and I had to run down the stairs and see what was going on on CNN. But I will say, in listening to the audio you just played, what I heard was the last desperate scream of white supremacy by the white underclass. They've come, as the great um, public intellectual Charles Barkley said a few months ago, just because your life sucks, it was not because some minorities did that to you. So these are folks, this is a small percentage of the population. Here we are, we're here in 2021. We're 20 years deep into the 21st century, which, um, since I've been writing academic press books, historians say it takes 20 years into a new century to shake off the old ways. We, we are now into 21st century thinking. And this is the crowd that um, bought the line, um, make, America, make America 1950 again, okay? Well, it's not 1950, baby. We're in the 21st century, and we've moved on. We are truly a multiracial, multicultural, biracial, I might add, when you see commercials and you see who's loving and married to who and who's having babies. And um, they haven't moved on. As what Will Levy said, you know what? If you like sports, the score was zero to 60. Trump lost, okay, Mm -hmm. in the court by judges that he got on the bench. And he lost zero to 60. And these folks are still buying this. And and I'll stop. I don't want to use up too much oxygen. But I just want to ask everyone, can we resolve that we will never, ever elect someone who has no public service experience? Because that was the problem here. We've had one president who didn't hold elected office. But you know what? That was Dwight Eisenhower, the five-star general that won World War II and saved Western democracy. And after he got out of um, the military, he became president of Columbia University. So that's still Mm. in the public service mode. We elected a con man. And I'll I'll say he was was always a con man. And my mentor had his number, Wayne Barrett, the greatest investigator journalist in New York in his generation, wrote 30 years ago that he was a con man. And people wouldn't listen. So I guess this is um, mm. kind of a kind of chickens come home to roost kind of thing. 
I'll stop. Eric, you know, Wayne said this was a small number compared to, but it's 70 million people who voted for the president again. Um, and so is it a small number or it's, is this really reflective of what this country is all about? Barbara, first of all, let me say that this was a sad day, a sad day indeed for our country. It was a shameful day. It was a sad day for um, the world. It was a sad day for democracy. People don't understand that we are the beacon of light for democracy across the world. We shake our finger and wag our finger and lecture other countries about how dictators, autocracies, authoritarians run their country. But we have allowed, our country has allowed, the Republican Party has allowed, business leaders have allowed, our neighbors and coworkers have allowed this man, this who is an enemy to our country and an enemy to democracy, to run roughshod over our Constitution, our system. Now, you have individuals that want to compare and contrast Black Lives Matter and, and the protests during this summer and say, oh, you had some people doing this and that and breaking windows and so forth. Listen, this was not a Denny's. This wasn't a Target. This wasn't a Sprint store where people were getting cell phones that you could track, you know. They broke into the U.S. Capitol building and forced evacuation of our lawmakers. The world was looking. It was a sad day for the world, but it was a good day for every dictator. It was a good day for Vladimir Putin, a good day mm. for the Shah of Iran, a good day for al-Qaeda, al a good day for every nation that has been lectured by the U.S. Because now they're sitting back saying, look at you. We have the strongest military in the world, but they were able to come in, just regular people, come in, as Wayne said, they want to make America 1950 again, uh, come in and push around our capital, our leadership, and come in people's offices, put their feet on their desk, run into the, the Senate chamber, run into the House. Now, I've been fortunate and blessed enough to be able to go on the House floor. I've been fortunate enough to uh, go and, you know, ride the subway underneath and go back and forth to various offices. My, my children have been fortunate enough to be invited and vote on behalf of U.S. congresspersons uh, doing vote on the floor and so forth. And I would have never, ever thought that I would see that type of disrespect by people that feel like this is their country. But if individuals were saying, oh, there is no white privilege, oh, it's not so bad. Well, my friend, take a look at the National Guard from 20 states and the response when you had individuals with weapons, automatic weapons, guarding uh, on the street, the nation's capital, and, and also its monuments, when you had peaceful protests. Look at that, and look at what we had on yesterday. These end up, Listen, the FBI report that is being held back uh, by President Trump through the U.S. Department of Justice by the FBI, has shown us, it outlines that white supremacists, white supremacist groups are the greatest threat to American security domestically. The, they are terrorists. They were not protesters. They were domestic terrorists. But, Barbara, at the end of the day, this is something that I talked about on the show. I said it would come about because the heartbeat of America, we've never truly dealt with the racism, foundations, and roots of the racism, discrimination, and hate of our country. We've always swept it under the rug. And we have a president that's given gasoline to this fire. We have a president that's given a bullhorn from the bully pulpit. We have a president that's given dog whistles and permission in order to do this. This is a travesty. And again, this is America. This is who we are. This was Charlottesville. This was Richmond. This was Michigan. Keep in mind, these same terrorists, these white supremacist terrorists, were coming to Virginia to kidnap our governor and lieutenant governor. They were trying to kidnap the governor of Michigan. These people are crazy. But they believe this foolishness. They believe it. And our Ted Cruz, Mitch McConnell, all the Republican leaders, they gave permission because of their inaction to check the president and to check their deranged voters of that party. So this, I believe this is the end of, of, if we don't deal with it, Barbara, this is the end 
but we have to be honest with ourselves and really deal with it. You know, when we were watching or when I was watching all the coverage yesterday and, and on social media, it just struck me as the 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 amount of people who talked about the fact that had this been um, uh, an all black group or or primarily people of color, that the response would have been really different. And it the question becomes then, why wasn't D.C. as prepared yesterday as they were back in the summer? You know, what's the difference? I'm going to play a clip from Joy Reid uh, because she has a perspective, and I'd like to get you guys' uh, perspective on the other end. She is an uh, anchor with MSNBC. The reason, as Claire talked about, that these people were so unafraid of the cops who were sparsely distributed through our capital, which hasn't been breached since 1812, when it was burned, the reason they could easily and casually, with their cameras on, film themselves throwing things through the walls of our capital, our property, going inside the capital, sitting in uh, Speaker Pelosi's office, casually take pictures of themselves, have that played on Fox News, they know that they are not in jeopardy because the cops are taking selfies with them, walking them down the steps to make sure they're not hurt, taking care with their bodies, not like they treated Freddie Gray's body. White Americans aren't afraid of the cops. White Americans are never afraid of the cops, even when they're committing insurrection, even when they're engaged in attempting to occupy our capital to steal the votes of people who look like me, because in their minds, they own this country, they own that capital, they own the cops, the cops work for them, and people like me have no damn right to try to elect a president. Because we don't get to pick the president, they get to pick the president, they own the president, they own the White House, they own this country. And so when you think you own it, you own the place, you ain't afraid of the police because the police are you and the police reflect back to them. We're with you. You're good. We're not going to hurt you because you're not them. Guarantee you if that was a Black Lives Matter protest in D.C., there would already be people shackled, arrested or dead. There was a um, quote out of the New York Times. A Capitol Police officer tried to reason with the crowd, quote, you guys just need to go outside. He pleaded with a man in the green pack backpack. When asked why they weren't expelling protesters, the officer said, quote, we've just got to let them do their thing now. Talk about that contrast, Will, the difference between the way that yesterday was treated from law enforcement's perspective compared to what they did last summer. Well, you know, I think that Joy, I saw Joy's comment, and I thought that she did a very good job, and a lot of people did an excellent job of pointing out that difference. Mm -hmm. But I think that we have to be careful, and as Eric said earlier, about being honest. There have been situations in this country where law enforcement has shot down white folks, too. I think of Waco, Texas, for example. There are situations where that has happened. So one of the things and one of the criticisms I have of the media sometimes is that we try to simplify things at the disadvantage, at the, at the expense of people really seeing the big picture and really coming to understand what is really going on. Race is always an undercurrent in our society. But if we want to fully, fully be honest about things, there's also class that's going on. And there's how, as Eric alluded and Wayne alluded earlier, how people pimp these different divisions that we have going on. Mm -hmm. So that's another key element. So it's not always. And, and then you got to realize, look, there's a lot of white people who have been part of the Black Lives Matters protest. So if it's just all white people are not afraid of the police, then how do you reconcile the white people who were clubbed and tear gassed? is part of the Black Lives Matters movement. How do you reconcile the white people that voted for Obama? How do you reconcile that? The white people, after this, Obama, beyond this election, had gotten the highest level of votes of anyone. How do you reconcile the white people who voted for Obama? So I think we have to be careful about just saying it's this or that and really delving into the deeper issues about class, about how our divisions get pimped and what is really going on. I love Eric 
Eric said the Republicans are culpable here. Guess what? The Democrats are also culpable. Why? Because for a long while in this country, we've got this partisan politics win at any cost going back and forth that has also been brewing here. Didn't we have the Occupy or Wall Street movement going on? Wasn't that progressives? Weren't those people who felt disenfranchised and felt this was their country and people were stealing something from them, so they are taken to the streets? So I think we have to be careful about just simplifying it as it's just all white people, it's just this or that. Race is absolutely an undercurrent, and when you try to just simplify it, then you start missing the real, the real tragedy that has been going on that all of us on this call, on this line, have lived actually dealing with race. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you know, that's there, but we got to be honest and really delve a bit deeper into what is going on so that we can really reflect the, the truth of what's going on in this country. Okay. Wayne, I saw you, it, you had uh, yeah. in, indicated you wanted to say something. Yes, and I absolutely agree with Will, because that's why I said earlier at the beginning, it's a, con it's a concentrated, small, and I emphasize small group of aggrieved, disenfranchised whites. It's, it's sort of the white version of the underclass, because, um, you know, um, Eugene Robinson of the Washington Post, when he wrote a book um, and, and that said that we can no longer... Okay, we'll talk about we shouldn't be so monolithic and paint with a broad brush. Well, in the 21st century, we can't say that there is such a thing as black America because it's actually four, it's subdivided into four groups. We now have a solid middle class. We have a thin layer of elite black folk that are more elite and more powerful than white people, but it's a small group. But then we have a solid middle class, we have a working class. But we have, we still, we know, we still talk about that kind of hard 20, 25 percent of the population that is desperately poor and can't get out of their situation. Well, it looks like white folks have that version, too. And they're angry. Somebody did something to them. And, and as far as the law enforcement part, something that our society has to address, and thank God Black Lives Matter has been doing it, police have said on the record that for every 20 police officers, 19 of them are good or professional officers, but you have the one psychopath in that 20 that, who, who, who will kill black people with impunity, brutalize everyone else, and police departments don't deal with it. That may be somebody's partner, and they're scared for their lives. They don't want to call this guy in because... Um, um, it may imperil him. And on, on that note, I'm a bit worried to breach the Capitol as if the British were here and Dolly Madison was snatching pictures off the walls in the, uh, the White House as the, as the city was burning down. There are people baked into law enforcement who are friends with these folks. So, you know, like... We, I'm sure on this show, I listened to your show and you invited me on, and you're often dealing with unconscious bias, but yesterday was conscious bias. Mm -hmm. Police taking selfies with domestic terrorists? What's up with that? <laughs> this, okay, and finally, so we saw our worst action movies in real time. There was to be these recent action movies, uh, Olympus Has Fallen and White House Down when the... Uh, Special Forces guys know how to get inside the White House and tear everything up. That's what we saw yesterday. And it wasn't a fantasy. And we're bugging out here. How, did this, how could this happen? If you're just joining us, we're talking about the consequences of the storming of the nation's capital by Trump supporters with Dr. Eric Claville, director for the Center of African-American Public Policy at Norfolk State University, Arthur Speaker, multimedia consultant and journalist Will Leviste, and Professor Wayne Dawkins, who is an author, journalist and professor of, of 
professor of, prof- what is that? Professional practices. There you go. At the School of Global Journalism and Communication at Morgan State University. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call. To join our conversation, Frank joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Frank. You're on the air. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go right ahead. Well, I I, I, uh, I congratulate you on the topic that you're dealing with. And you have three experts, Dr. Clavel, uh, Dr. Dawkins, and uh, everybody else. But I just have to put some perspective. And they mentioned just uh, blacks. And I want that you consider also the Hispanics and the Indians. This is, uh, I, think, I, I think they consider it because they said this is a... Um, just not white. They're other mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. But uh, I have to disagree a little bit with Claville, where he says that this is a, uh, he calls it uh, a, what is, authoritarian. Well, if, they, if, if this was an authoritarian state, like in China, they would have caught that um, the insurance in D.C. This country is a plutocracy run by the rich for the rich. And they don't care about Hispanics. They don't care about poor white and poor uh, African-American. Okay. Frank, thanks so much for the call. Let me give Eric a chance to respond. Go right ahead, Eric. <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, Frank, thank you so much uh, for your call and your perspective. Uh, just a, I, I, I'm not sure. I just want to make a quick correction. I was saying that we have a democracy here and there are autocracies and there are authoritarians and dictators elsewhere. But to your point, I do agree with the caller that this is a country that's run by the rich, that cares for the wealthy and those that have access. And the only way that we can have a solution to this problem, and I've said it so many times with racism, is if this is a white American, white male privilege problem, okay? That's the only persons that can solve it because those are the individuals that can move the needle to change policy and practice, policy and practice and laws. Those are the individuals that can move this. So until that group realizes that racism is a bad business model, then it's never going to change. But I have to disagree in part with both Will and Wayne. Wayne, this is not a small group of people that's, that's, uh, that have – uh, that, that believe that they're disenfranchised and that they that the America doesn't work for them. Over 70 million people voted for this man. Over seven. That's that's half of the almost half of the voting electorate. The wins that President elect Joe Biden had were by a very small margin. So that shows that our country is split down the middle. We have a now the people that are out there. They're bold. Uh, this is a pandemic. They have no mask. Many of them are going to get sick. I'm going to mm. uh, possibly die because of this. Uh, but those individuals are out there because they feel they have nothing to lose. But you have individuals in shirts and ties. You have individuals at the country clubs. You have individuals that believe it, the exact same and that are sitting back in part, some cheering these people on because they're doing what's in their hearts that they will want to do. So you have we have a country that believes in what this president is saying, believes in his policies, and are ignoring his actions at the detriment of our democracy. And what we'll mention, we can't put this in black and white, I agree, but here, here's the difference. When the system is wrapped around policies that affect those that are downtrodden, and African Americans are at the lower end of that because of our history is much longer, much, in, much involved in the uplifting of all people, right? So when you side with black people, that's why when whites actually, white Americans with privilege and access, uh, forfeit that by coming along fighting for black opportunity, you know, they're forfeiting their uh, uh, opportunity for access and acceptance into America's uh, privilege, which, which gives privilege to whites. So that's why white people be, uh, beat with billy clubs when they walk with Black Lives Matter, not because they're not because they're just white, but because they're walking and siding with us. You know, Hoover himself, uh, who was over the FBI, said that the greatest threat to America was Black Panthers and, and, and Dr. King and so forth. Not because they were violent. It's because that those are the individuals that would give uh, African Americans and communities that are downtrodden and who have policy pushing them down encouragement in order to lift their heads and be 
a man and a woman who they're supposed to be. So this, this, this deals with access. And again, it is a white privilege issue in America. Just take a look at it. The, the, the man that broke into Nancy Pelosi's office, and they trash other offices too. And trust me, my heart was breaking because I know how sacred that building is. With his feet on the desk like he's at the house chilling on the couch, going through documents and so forth. This is, I mean, these people, I, I, you know, America, more specifically white America, should be just vomiting, you know, this morning, just upset because you have these individuals. And, and listen, I want to say, African Americans and black America, Hispanic America, Indian America, they cannot, we cannot stop this problem. This is a white America problem, and white America has to address this if we're going to move past it. Will, you wanted to, say, to add something before we go to the yeah, next I'll call? Yeah, I'll quick, Barbara. I, mm-hmm. I, was, I wanted to clarify, Barry. I wasn't saying that we can't. It's not, you can't, I'm not saying that there's not racism here. I'm just saying that, it's, that there are many other elements, so we can't just simplify it into black and white, and that, and that the media should be doing a better job of really parsing it out so that people fully understand all of the dynamics that's going on. Also, to your caller, uh, I'm actually half Latino. My mother is an Afro-Latino, my late mother from the Dominican Republic. So the call, I'm not sure what country he's from, but he's from Cuba or if he's from Mexico or Venezuela. He knows that black people in those countries are also catching hell, black people and indigenous people, because they have caste systems. And so to come to what Eric is talking about, he's actually talking about we're seeing the American version of these various caste systems rooted in race. And so that very much is an issue in Latin America and, in fact, may even be even worse. And many of what is going on in the Latin American countries are absolutely about race and caste. And what we're seeing is that here in this country, African Americans have done the best job of rising up and fighting against these caste systems and saying, no, we want to truly have equality. We're not just going to be the service economy people for the American economy. We want true equality. That has been, that has been going on since Frederick Douglass, through, on through to Martin Luther King, on through to Black Lives Matter today. That's why Black Lives Matter is a global movement. It's about how indigenous people and black people are catching hell all over the planet including in Latin America. Mm -hmm. So there are Afro... uh, Forgive me, folks. Guess what? There are black people who are Hispanic. (laughs) Hispanics are not... Most black black people that came from Africa during the transatlantic slave went to to the Southern Hemisphere. So where are all those people at? You don't see them on Telemundo, right? Why? Why don't you see them? Because we're made to be invisible. And that's what Black Lives Matter is about. Yes, Black people, all the skin color matters, too. The uh, book um, Isabella Wilkerson wrote is cast. Is that right? And do I have the right author? That's what I thought. Yes. So that goes to your point that you were were discussing. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Rick joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Rick. You're on the air. Hi, Barbara. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. First time I've ever called in. Thank you. respect, I'm a I'm a 65-year-old white male, and I uh, have not listened to the whole show, but it's amazing how much I have heard that I agree with. Um, It is, um, I have been, to use one of the speaker's words, I have been vomiting since Donald Trump was elected. It is unbelievable to me that we as a country elect someone like him to be a president, a man without confidence and a man with no moral character. And what I've barely been able to function since break-in yesterday. Uh, as a white male, I can attest to the fact that in this country there is systemic racism, there is white privilege, and it is wrong. It is, you know, it is not what God wants us to do. It's not the way we should live together. And I guess my really last point is, as I was watching this hideous situation yesterday, all I could think of was, you know, you know, if there's been black people or people of color protesting something, there would have been, there probably would have been death. Um, the, the response yesterday was ridiculous, given the threat, and probably the only reason why it was not more forceful is because Donald Trump may have had something to do with it, and because they were white people and not people of color. So uh, 
hopefully that is a perspective and uh, I appreciate you taking my call. Thank you so much for the call, Rick. I appreciate that. Wayne, anything you want to add to uh, Rick's comments or add to, to that discussion? Yeah, absolutely. Because he said he thinks um, the president has something to do with it. He absolutely has something to do with it. Okay. Here's the wall street journal where he said to the group, well, we have to have peace. So go home. We love you. You're very special. As okay, a matter of fact, so hold on a here, second, Wayne. Um, we actually have that clip, if I'm not mistaken. Do we, Todd? Yes, can we play that? I know your pain. I know you're hurt. We had an election that was stolen from us. It was a landslide election, and everyone knows it, especially the other side. But you have to go home now. We have to have peace. We have to have law and order. We have to respect our great people in law and order. We don't want anybody hurt. It's a very tough period of time. There's never been a time like this where such a thing happened, where they could take it away from all of us, from me, from you, from our country. This was a fraudulent election. But we can't play into the hands of these people. We have to have peace. So go home. We love you. You're very special. You've seen what happens. You see the way others are treated that are so bad and so evil. I know how you feel. But go home and go home in peace. Okay, Wayne, go ahead and finish your thought. On that note, on that note and I'm going to go there quickly because we're running out of time. With the physical evidence, it is time to invoke the 25th Amendment <laughs> for removal of person who's unfit for office. So a dozen times I've heard A-list pundits this morning reference the 25th Amendment. People inside the Trump White House are saying we may have to put this in play. This is the man who co-wrote the 25th Amendment, Emanuel Seller. And it's time that it's been tested twice in real life. It's time to do it. We can't wait 13 days to get this guy out of here because he may bomb Sweden or do something psychotic. Um, in, in the last day. Wayne, you wrote the book, uh, the the uh, biography of this, this gentleman. Tell us the name of the book again and where people can find it. <laughs> the name of the book is Emanuel Seller, Immigration and Civil Rights Champion. Um, I've been out here hustling. The book is in every Barnes & Noble in Hampton Roads, and they're signed by me. Um, they're um, uh, in Barnes & Noble, Amazon, through, my, through the university press I write for, I'll give the 30-second the elevator speech. So this is the greatest legislator of the American century, from which would be the end of World War II to the mid-1970s, that unfortunately you've never heard of. But he co-wrote three constitutional amendments, including that 25th Amendment. His name is on 300 laws. But my main motivation was he is the godfather of immigration reform because we had a 40-year period in America where it was called national origin in the early 1900s. And what that basically meant was that America decided that they only wanted certain white people come into this country. So they were discriminating against certain white people, Italian, Jew, mm -hmm. Eastern European, not even in the equation. But Sellers said that's wrong. And during the Cold War, that created a major problem for us. And in 1965, President Johnson signed the Immigration Reform Act in front of the Statue of Liberty. And that meant that if you wanted to come here legally, it no, no longer mattered where you came from. And that motivated me to write it because I'm out of immigrant back uh, your from audio, Chinese. Yeah, your audio is going in and out on us. Uh, so let me go to Eric. Uh, to explain explain uh, for us what the 25th Amendment actually means. What would happen? Yeah, so, yeah, so the 25th Amendment itself is a provision that's recently, when I say recently added to the U.S. Constitution, we're talking in the last uh, 60, 70 years, where anyone not fit for office by mental defect um, or other or incapacitated who cannot operate in uh, the free world and operate in office can be removed with the a letter simply sent 
to the Congress, endorsed by the cabinet members of that particular president's office and the vice president. And it is a done deal. It is time to do that. It is time. As a matter of fact, um, now, keep in mind, you have a lot of people who have been working in the president's office, uh, uh, Mick Matt Mulvaney. You have individuals who have resigned and said, I can't do anything. Now, keep in mind, um, I don't champion these individuals because they were complicit for the last four years. So they're jumping ship the last 13 days. So I, I, I don't champion them. But they're right. You know, it's time for this person for us to move on from him. He still has the nuclear code. He still has the authority of the president of the United States. And you have all these individuals who are under his control and some that are staying because they're afraid of who he may put in office. And let me say this. I've never seen a group of grown men and women being afraid of another, another man. You know, I mean, this, this, this is baffling. This is baffling to me because – Congress is actually, in, in effect, the president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House, is really more powerful than the, pre- the office of the president. You know, when you, when you really boil it down to what can and cannot be done, who can overrule who, and so forth. And, why, and these individ- individuals being afraid and doing what they're doing is just absolutely baffling to me. And the, the other part of this, uh, 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 Barbara, is, you know, retribution is coming. Uh, the Republican Party sold its soul. They made a deal with the devil, and this is what happens when you make a deal with the devil. Because and one thing that uh, Trump's son said was correct, this is not the Republican Party anymore. This is the party of Trump, and it's true. So Trump is going to go away in 13 days out of office, but Trumpisms are not going any, anywhere. Unfortunately, these people are – they are brainwashed. Unfortunately, these individuals – or have been fed into the lies of uh, misinformation, the lies of history, the lies of white privilege. And unfortunately, they're taking this and moving forward and trying to act like this is 1800 again. But I do believe that this is 1861. This is the new civil war, and we're going to have to deal with it. We're going to have to deal with it or our country will not stand. Um, we got a, a message through Messenger. Raymond uh, wants to know, quote, why are some of the guests choosing this discussion to explain both sides and nuances? It is a certainty based on prior actions. Black, brown and other folks would not have the same treatment. So, well, since you started looking at all the nuances and sides, I'm going to let you respond to him. Oh, because I started off stating that obvious. So now after we state the obvious, how how long do you want us to go on stating the obvious? At some point, we need to have to have a conversation with those who don't want to see that obvious. And that's why I shifted to challenging your your white listeners, which is how are you going to reconcile this? How are you going to reconcile your law and order president who, who encouraged an insurrection? How are you going to reconcile what do you actually mean by law and order? Because apparently... What you mean by law and order is keeping black people in check. You don't mean law and order is following the rules of this nation. So at some point, I would say to the to the uh, questioner, you know, out of sincerity, we had to move beyond stating the obvious and moving towards okay, how are we going to move towards towards where our country is going to become better? We've got about nine minutes left. I'm going to try to get as many phone calls in as I can because the phone lines are lit up. Mark joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Mark. You're in the air. Good. Good afternoon to you and your distinguished guests. Uh, just two quick things. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know if any of your guests saw uh, where the black police officer, Capitol Police officer, kept running up the steps. And in each landing, he raised his stick as if he was going to try to contain uh, the people who broke into the into the house. And I just looked at where he was conflicted. And you could tell he had a conflict. He had a weapon, and he didn't even want to strike the people with a stick. Versus if it had been reversed, we already know what that looks like, what would have happened. And mm-hmm. then real quick, if I had to take a positive out of tomorrow, uh, yesterday, was is that the idea that now our legislators know that we're literally arms distance 
from them physically and tangibly. And I hope that the fear of God went reverberated through all sectors of government yesterday to understand that we the people do have a say in this country and that hopefully maybe that current fear that all of them felt yesterday will maybe get them to recenter and refocus mm. on their constituents and not their own self gain. Thank you, Mark, for the call. We appreciate that. Wayne, what do you think? Will, will the lawmakers reconsider and, and take a different look at how they handle developing laws in our country? I, you know, I'm not sure because you would think, you know, will enough Trump lost the election and... and okay, we are having major um, problems. We might say... Uh, you can't hear me? Yeah, we can now. Try it again. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? We're having problems with Wayne's uh, okay. audio, so... Uh, uh, on the streets of Brooklyn, Will would notice. We'd say, um, do I know you? Uh, it's time to move on. For those who were the president, it's a... Okay, I tell you what. Let me move on to um, another caller, and we'll come back to you, Wayne, because your audio is gone. Uh, let's go to Kenny in Portsmouth. Hi, Kenny. You're on the air. Hi, Barbara. Thank you for taking my call. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I think that um, I think that a the problem there is more um, to, that we need to look on it on an international level. Right now, the international people, people in other countries, they're making a mockery of us. You know, they're you know they're making a mockery of our political system. But I think what they don't understand is that that, that problem is not a political problem, but it's a racial problem. It's a racial problem because uh, when I first watching the the uh, first watching it on the news, they said it, it was peaceful because they were outside the gate. There was no problem, and next thing you know, they're inside and they're and it's like they rolled the red carpet out. You see them walking in; it's like no big deal. So uh, um, the thing is, there was no um, there was nothing. There was no there, no violence at them. You know, mm -hmm. so that's why. And, and the lady that was commentating, she was saying that it was a peaceful, that it was peaceful, and it was peaceful at the beginning because nobody was doing nothing because they had a right uh, to, to. There was no need to not be peaceful, you know, because nothing was held at them. But when the uh, when we did our peaceful thing outside the gate, next thing you know, here comes the tear gas out of nowhere. The tear gas to get us to, to, to move so a photo shoot can be made. And we know who orchestrated that tear yeah. gas. Who, right, so he could do that purpose. So, and the thing is, um, we were just, we were outside the gate. So, and these people, they managed to get inside past the more than five feet. They just kept right on going. If we, if one or two of us would have even got two, two or five feet uh, inside that gate, right? Got gotcha, you, Kenny. You know what? Right and we get your point. I'm going to move on because we're almost out of time. So I appreciate your calling. Kenny was comparing the what happened when President Trump came out to do his photo op holding the Bible and how they used um, uh, uh, force in order to move the protesters back. Eric, you want to respond? Yes, very quickly, because I want us to get as many callers in as possible. Listen, he's exactly right. This is a race issue. I guess a white privilege issue. And I say again, the solution to this problem is individuals in white America who have access and privilege address this issue head, uh, hands down. If you look at the photos, first of all, we knew these people were coming weeks in advance because the president on Twitter was telling them to come. He told them to have a wild time. He told the Proud Boys to stand by and stand, stand down and stand by. He hyped them up at the rally. We heard the excerpts that you played. Listen. This is the biggest threat to America and democracy in our country. And we need to understand that. We need to accept that. These are the same type of people that tore this country in half in 1861, and we did not deal with them at the end of 1865. We gave them a pass. These are the same people that killed in the 1920s, the people in Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, because they were jealous, because they had hardy hearts, and because they believed that they had more privilege, but their life sucked. And we swept that under the rug. These are the same people that ransacked Richmond for the same reason. These are the same people in Charlotte that came and killed that young lady and injured others. These are the same people that had guns. We had to shut down 
our time in Richmond last year because they had automatic weapons saying this is our country. These are the same people. And if we don't deal with it earnestly, I'm here to tell you, our country will not stand. 2021, it's 1861 again. The question now is, what will be the difference? Okay, Wayne, you wanted to add something. Okay, because we're almost out of time. Yes. And, and I absolutely hear you, um, um, Professor Khalil, but I'm going to push back just gently. I'm going to quote what Barack Obama said when Trump won. And our less American than two journey, minutes. Go ahead. And our American journey tends to be two steps forward and one step backward. And we took a huge step backward. And I'm, I, I'm you know, the, the next time, if I ever come back again, we'll come back with good data because I still maintain this is a minority within white America. I'm a northerner and I came south to teach and to do journalism. And I knew there were the unreconstructed southern racists here. In fact, there was one I remember who got very upset because I said, you realize your ancestors got played, right? And I said, what you mean? I said, do you know that on 20 percent of white people during the uh, before the Civil War were slaveholders? So your poor ancestor died to make some minority rich plantation owner rich. And he said, that's not fair. And I said, but it's true, bro. You know, that's what happened. (laughs) And with that, we have some educating to do to go a step forward. Thank you so much. Will, you got 10 seconds for your last comment. (laughs) No, I I think, again, to to Wayne's point, it is what Eric said, but it's also more nuanced. So we got to get to the nuance because this is the 21st century with all kinds of other dynamics and people at play. So it's more nuanced. All right. That's Dr. Eric Laville. That's Dr. Will Levis. And that's Professor Wayne Dawkins. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And thanks for the great conversation. And before we go, audience, I want to tell you that about the Urban League Community Leaders Awards um Uh, breakfast. They are still going to hold it on January the 18th and um, it will be virtual this year. So you will be able to just log on to www.ulhr.org and you can register there and uh, find out who is going to be awarded. It is called Facing Forward for Our Future and this is the Urban League Community Leaders Awards. They do this every year. It's a wonderful event and this year they are are honoring Jonathan Zur with the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities, James W. Dyke Jr., former Virginia Secretary of Education, Dr. Angela A. Reddix, President and CEO of Ardix, Dr. Jordan Asher, Centera Healthcare, Mark Johnson of Truist Bank, Judge Gerald C. Jones and family, Isaiah Mariner, and Richard Barry III of Landmark Foundation. And Isaiah Mariner is with Churchland High School. So go to www.ulhr.org, register, attend online, and help them to celebrate. And congratulations to all of them. So we recognize that you have choices and we are so grateful that you chose another view and you choose another view every Thursday at noon. If you'd like to hear this show again or share it with a friend, please visit our website, anotherviewradio.org and download the podcast. We are determined in 2021 to increase our subscribers to our eView newsletter. So go and sign up at our website, anotherviewradio.org. Next week on Another View, it's the award-winning Another View Roundtable with a fresh take on issues that you care about. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. And Todd Washburn is our audio engineer. And Jordan Christie answered our phones. Please remember, wear a mask, stay socially distant, wash your hands frequently, and join us again next Thursday at noon for another view.